uh, we will be uh, providing a recording of the session once uh, once complete and sending you uh, an email with a link to the recording should you wish to review anything or share it with colleagues. So just a few quick words here on uh, our presenters. Um, on the left is uh, Sean Malamud, who is, who is standing by. Sean is a uh, technical solution specialist who's been with PCI for uh, over six years. And uh, he is uh, an expert in all of our technology, uh, represent, has represented us uh, around the world, and um, helps really is uh, passionate about helping our customers become successful with, with our technology. Uh, myself, I'm the Director of Marketing, and uh, I've also been with the company about the same amount of time, and it's a pleasure to be here today. So before we get started, we want to know what the composition of the audience is, uh, and also um, what type of imagery you're working with. So I'm going to launch a quick poll here uh, to get a sense of what uh, type of imagery you currently use to generate DEMs with. Uh, we have a number of options listed there. <clears throat> we have satellite imagery, uh, either Pleiades or Worldview or other sensors. Uh, we also have uh, aerial imagery, uh, high, high resolution digital frame cameras such as UltraCam or DMC. Uh, perhaps some of you are using some new platforms such as UAVs or uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, and uh, maybe some of you are using um, LIDAR surveys to derive your elevation information. And if you're using something else, or if you want to let us know exactly what uh, type of um, platform you're using or type of source you're using for collecting your elevation data, just let us know in the, in the questions box. We would be happy to, uh, to hear what it is that you're using and uh, try to understand uh, how we might help you. So it looks like most people have uh, contributed their answers, so thank you so much for that. I'm um, just going to leave it open for a few more moments. Looks like a few of you are still trying to get in to give your answers. Great. Thanks very much. Um, so just a few quick words on, uh, on our technology on PCI and um, how it is that we uh, provide technology into the marketplace and, and where we're positioned. Um, PCI Geomatics is, is, is a Canadian company that's based in Canada, and uh, we, we have been in the business of uh, geospatial remote sensing for over 34 years. And uh, we offer several things. Um, probably the, uh, the main technology that we've been providing for many, many years is our desktop remote sensing and orthomosaicing software suite, which is known as Geomatica. Geomatica is uh, a tool that is used by universities around the world and by professional organizations to uh, do several tasks, uh, primarily for uh, orthomosaicing, uh, really is powerful for, it's really quite powerful for uh, producing uh, uh, large mosaics and uh, handling large volumes of data. On the other side, we have our high volume production system known as GXL or Geoimaging Accelerator. And really what this tool is able to do is to actually uh, simplify the processing by having fewer operators and uh, is, is able to process in parallel large volumes of data. This, this kind of system can be deployed to a server environment inside your organization or even in a cloud-based environment, which has been done by several of our customers. In the middle of the two, you see Python, which is a uh, open source programming language that we make available in our software suite, which really allows you to build in automation uh, in, your, in your specific workflow. And these solutions are, are scalable and they're flexible. They, uh, they can be connected to other software applications and we can really do a lot with, uh, with the Geomatica platform. Just a few more words on the uh, sort of key differences, if you will, or, or the, uh, the type of solution that we might uh, be able to provide to you. On the left, we have our GXL system and uh, you can see that uh, uh, through uh, a lot of automation and distributed processing, we can accomplish 
um, very large uh, image production with uh, fewer operators and uh, on the right, what we have is you can you can also achieve similar results or uh, do more in-depth analysis using Geomatica. So whether you're trying to implement a system where you have fewer operators or you're trying to have uh, develop expertise, maybe develop capacity within your organization, you can definitely um, scale or in increase your throughput by uh, adding uh, just more licenses and more experts within your organization. So we have a lot of flexibility in terms of how you can leverage Geomatica as a tool to really uh, achieve productivity gains. I mentioned already the Python capability and really what this is uh, great for is the ability to develop a custom workflow. So you could leverage existing capability within Geomatica and connect it to perhaps an, an external third-party tool such as ArcGIS, or it could be an open source uh, GIS package or uh, any, any kind of uh, capability really that you can think of. We can uh, build a, a, a workflow uh, that leverages uh, Geomatica capability. We have about 550 algorithms as well as access to different types of objects within our environment that can be called and automated so that you can build a specific application or, or a workflow. And uh, those applications can be deployed on different environments. You can deploy them on a desktop computer or you could put them on a, on a server or you might even deploy some kind of a web application that could definitely be done as well. Today we're going to be looking at several concepts related to DEMs and uh, we have some of them listed here. So we'll be looking at DSM extraction or DEM extraction and uh, we have a fully automated process for doing that, for matching the two images and taking advantage of the uh, stereo overlap between them to, to derive elevation values. We'll also be looking at DSM to DTM filtering. So this is a, either a fully automated or, a, or it could be a semi-automated method to take the surface features off to create a terrain model that can then be used for either calculating um, what those features are in the DSM or it could be used to generate uh, ortho mosaic uh, product. Uh, change detection I mentioned already. So we could actually have a scenario where we have multiple elevation data sets collected over the same location over time and so we can derive change map of the elevation features and uh, this is a particularly important application for things like stockpile extraction which is next on our list and uh, another uh, capability is, uh, is that we can use the elevation information to look at forest stand height measurements so essentially looking at vegetation analysis and then the last thing that we're going to be looking at is uh, Python-based uh, volumetric change, change extraction uh, workflow. Um, so Sean is uh, standing by to uh, provide uh, all of this great content which is coming up right now. And uh, at this point, I will pass, over, pass control over to Sean who's going to take over the presentation. I'll be back for another a couple of polls and uh, I'm here to answer any questions along the way if you have anything that you want to um, uh, ask about feel free to enter it in the chat window over to you Sean well thank you very much Kevin uh, that was a very nice introduction to our different product lines and the topics that we're going to be covering in this webinar here so uh, just to get started, we're going to go through, uh, as Kevin mentioned, some of the different concepts uh, that he mentioned in that table of contents there. So the first topic that we're going to take a look at is our DEM extraction capabilities. And just to provide a little bit of an overview of the DEMs that we can extract, and this is a core technology, so everything, all of the different applications that we're going to show uh, using DEMs are, so it's, it's obviously it's very essential that we have a very strong extraction algorithm in order to extract these different products. So one thing that is very important to us is that this is a core technology within PCI. Uh, this is an essential product or an essential uh, piece of data that's necessary for a variety of different workflows, whether it's orthomosaicing or whether you're actually extracting or doing volumetric calculations. 
So as a result, this is an area that we put a lot of investment into and we're always continuously enhancing uh, this technology. So with that being said, just within the Geomatica 2015 SP1 release, which was released uh, in the summer, uh, in just this past summer, or if you're in the southern hemisphere, I guess, uh, just this past winter. Um, and basically, what we've done is we've improved the DSM quality, but we've also made the extraction process faster, actually quite significantly faster, about three to four times increase in performance when it comes to the extraction part of the workflow. So let's take a look at some numbers here. So we have some UltraCam aerial imagery. If we look at the original algorithm or the older algorithm, it was 160 seconds to extract. And with the current algorithm, it's about 40 seconds. So this is a, sees a marked improvement of about four times. If we look at a much larger data set, uh, Worldview 2 in this particular case, it took 35 minutes to extract the elevation values in our older code. And now with our new algorithm, it's taking about 11 minutes. So once again, another marked improvement about three times. It's important to note, however, that uh, basically the, ex the workflow of extracting your digital elevation model includes also epipolar generation and geocoding. So those two aspects were unchanged. So it was the extraction part that was changed. So overall, what you should expect is an improvement in processing times by about one and a half to two times, which is still quite significant. From a quality perspective, we have improved the correlator. So we're now getting fewer blunders and less failed areas, which is very important. We're getting sharper edges and more detail. We have better handling of rapid changes in elevation. We have a new smoothing filter that is much better at preserving the detail in your digital elevation models. And then we have improved merging of tri-stereo DEMs as this is becoming a popular product in the satellite marketplace. So let's just take a look at some of the examples. So here we have a uh, DEM or DSM that was extracted from our older algorithm. And as you can see, there's some very sharp ridges here. And you can see that the detail is not amazing. And you can see the ridges here, there's some failed areas in the correlation. Now if we look at our new product, the new algorithm, uh, two things should be quite visibly noticeable. One is a significant improvement in the actual detail of the elevation model and the preservation of rapid changes in elevation. So uh, a good preservation of this ridge point here or this ridge line here. So these are uh, just from a quality perspective, it should be quite visible about the, the improvements that this algorithm has made. Now if we take a look at another data set just very quickly. So this is a Pleiades Tri-Stereo. Uh, this is extracted with the older algorithm. So you can notice that the detail, say, here on these sort of smaller features is a little bit washed out. And if you look over here on the buildings where we have limited structure. Now if we move to our new algorithm, you can see we have much more detail along these features here. And the structure of our buildings, or our buildings have a much more structure to them. They're much more intact and, and details even on the roof. So as you can see, there's a significant improvement for both the quality and the performance. So I'm just going to leave the PowerPoint for a second and going to show you some actual examples. So I want to show you a Barcelona or Spot 6 result over Barcelona. And as you can see here that there's the terrain is quite rugged. Uh, it's quite mountainous in this area to the north of Barcelona. And you can see that the new algorithm has done quite a nice job at retaining the detail and retaining the uh, sharpness of these ridges here. Just to show another quick example before we move on. Uh, this is an urban area. So this is Graz in Austria. This is uh, UltraCam uh, imagery. And as you can see that we have a lot, of, a lot more structure, a lot of structure in our buildings, a lot of detail on the roofs, as well as the vegetation. We're getting a lot of detail on the canopy as well. So there's just two very quick examples of some of the quality that can now be expected with our current Geomatica version that's available for download on our website. So some additional DSM benefits. So DSMs, one of the one of the additional benefits is we now we rasterize our DSMs, whether it's a point cloud 
or whether it's the actual DSM extracted from our software or if it's a TIN model or a variety of different vector data sets, we have a special interpolator that's designed for handling complex terrain where we're not using a triangular irregular network. So this creates less artifacts and a much more uh, realistic looking terrain when you zoom in. We also have automatic mosaicing of multiple DSMs extracted in a batch. So you don't need to worry about having to piece them together afterwards. We automatically handle and we make sure to take the centermost parts of the images when we use the different DSMs. And we also have special handling of low contrast imagery. So this is another area where uh, we've had a marked improvement in our correlators in order to handle this kind of data. So let's first take a look at, say for example, another software that would use a TIN model concept in order to generate the digital surface model. And as you can see here that we get the sort of tinny effect, this triangular effect, which when you zoom in, creates an essentially a less or a more artificial looking uh, terrain. When we compare this with the result generated from PCI Geomatica or the GXL, depending on which system you have, you're able to see that it's a much more realistic terrain. We don't have those systematic linear artifacts and we also don't have that triangular appearance when we zoom in. As also mentioned, uh, one of the improvements is also our correlator where we get better uh, correlation and less failed values even in poor contrast. So generally a very challenging area to extract digital elevation models on uh, includes areas uh, such as snow cover regions. So here we have a, an example of Greenland and this is the DSM that was extracted from it and I actually have this example which I'd like to show. So you can see here, this is basically if we zoom in and we compare the imagery that was used and then what we extracted, you can see that the details in say the dimples along the edge of the ridge you see that we retain the ridge itself quite nicely. So overall, and even in the flat areas where we have very little detail, we still get very, uh, very nice looking results or very high quality results in our digital surface model. Okay, so one of the biggest applications of using digital uh, elevation models is still within the ortho mosaicing workflow. So while this may not be the most exciting application of it, it's still a very important and uh, important commercial application of digital elevation models. So I'd like to reintroduce for some of you or perhaps introduce for the first time our live DEM editing tool. Now this tool is meant for advanced interactive DEM touch-ups or DEM editing. So it can be used on a digital elevation model after you've already ran an automatic filtering process on it in order to touch it up and improve areas. Or it can be run as the primary editing tool in order to convert a digital surface model to a digital terrain model. It's really very flexible in how you wish to use it. You can automatic, it automatically filters. So or one of the issues with the automatic filters is often they're not able to handle all terrain types. So they tend to make mistakes where they either overfilter or underfilter. So by taking control and doing using a semi-automatic approach with many different filtering options, it gives you much more control to handle these different uh, variations in the terrain. The live DEM editor can also assess, uh, allow you to assess the vertical accuracy of your digital elevation models. And we'll show that in a moment. And then of course, once you've assessed it, you can then fix problems due to over or under filtering. So this is a, just a quick screenshot. And as I said, we want to, for the live demonstrations, we wish to show more about uh, the exciting applications of using it um, for post-processing or analysis or information extraction. So here we're just gonna show some quick slides to show you the concept. And we have a lot of videos on our YouTube page and on our, on our website that you can visit that goes into detail about using this uh, tool. So the idea is you can draw a polygon around an area of interest that you want to filter. You can select a filtering option. You then filter it. And our filtering options can be quite uh, advanced for working on uh, different types of terrains with different types of surface features. And then you can draw a one-to-one -one window that's going to create, uh, generate on the fly an ortho image based on the edits we made in our DEM. And it's going to do this for all the overlapping images in this bounding box. And we can then flicker back and forth in order to see 
what the accuracy is. And the concept's very simple. If we have an accurate elevation model, then terrain features, bare earth features, should be very stable because no matter the viewing angle, once we orthorectify it with an accurate DEM, they should overlap perfectly. Now, the other thing we should be looking for is that surface features such as trees and houses are undistorted, meaning that we've successfully removed them. But you will see a flicker back and forth. And just for fun, we tend to call this our earthquake test. So now I think I'm going to pass it back over to Kevin for a moment so he can conduct our second poll in this webinar. Kevin? Kevin appears to be having some technical difficulties, so I am going to do my best to start this poll. So I'm going, so the question is, is how do you use DEMs? So we're launching the poll now, and uh, please feel free to answer. So the couple options are, you mainly as a step in orthomosaicing processing. Uh, I, I can see that everyone's answering, so it looks like everyone can read, read the questions or read the possible answers here. We have a few more minutes for uh, a few more people to finish answering. The numbers are still fluctuating quite a bit. Okay, it looks like uh, most people have already put in their answers, so I think we'll close the poll in three, two, one, and the poll is now closed. So basically it looks like we have about 50, majority of the people, over Muted. half of the people are uh, doing it for orthomosaicing. But we also have around half of the people who are also using it for volumetric analysis, which is great because that's going to be one of our primary demonstrations here in this webinar. Okay, so we are going to move on, uh, continue on with this webinar here. So now we're going to get into some of the more fun stuff, the, the applications of these DEMs that we derive or these digital surface models. So the first set of applications we're going to look at includes semi-automatic applications. So this is areas that we can significantly improve or enhance the user experience or enhance the productivity, but perhaps require still a little bit of interactivity or some user manual input. So the first one that we're going to show a live demonstration for is how you can use the live DEM editor to quickly and accurately extract a, a significant number or a group of stockpiles in an area. So I'm now going to leave the presentation and let's take a look at our first demo. So the, I can open up this image here just to show you what we're dealing with. And actually the first thing, sorry I apologize, made a mistake there. The first step that we want to do is we're just going to make a copy of the digital surface model that we want to extract. So I'm going to actually open up the copy version of it. And you'll see why in a moment I just made a copy. So when you go into this area and you provide your DEM, and if it's been extracted with our software, and this technique will work whether it's your DSM has been extracted with our software or a different software, but it's definitely ideal to have it extracted with Geomatica. So what we can do is we can go into Layer, Go to DEM editing, and I'm just going to add the imagery. So by default, when we generate or extract a DEM using Geomatica or GXL, we create also the ortho image at the same resolution of the DSM that we extracted. So this gives you additional information when you go in to edit or perform additional analysis, and everything's nicely co-registered. So what we want to do is we want to go into here, and I'm just going to create a new vector layer. So I added one here. I just clicked on this button. And we can look at this in two ways. So the traditional approach to edit these features is you might, for example, try to draw polygons that 
you do your best to sort of outline each and individual stockpile. However, you can see that, you know, I didn't do a very good job. It was pretty coarse, and this can be quite laborious in order to do this. So let me introduce you to a much better and faster approach. So with the DEM editing, I'm going to, once again, I'm going to select my vector polygon layer, and I'm going to draw a outline. I can go around here. I'm just going to continue drawing around these stockpiles here, and I'm going to go around a whole bunch of stockpiles that I'm interested in extracting as vectors. I'll just go close it off over here. So now you can see I've drawn uh, basically an area of interest. So I can now go to my filtering options. Because it's a relatively flat area, we can choose the terrain filter flat. If it's a more rugged area, you'd be better off with the terrain filter rough. And because we're dealing with some decent size sizes here, we're going to increase the filter size to 250. We'll keep our gradient as is. And then I'm just going to simply run this filter. So in the first go, we've removed most of it, but we're not quite fully removed everything, so we can run it again without. And that's the benefit of this uh, terrain filter is that you can run it multiple times without the concern of um, removing non-surface features. So, and we'll try it one more time, just for good luck. Okay, so I think we filtered it quite nicely. So now we've basically uh, done this work on our editing filter here. So I can click on the Save button, and let's save this result out. It's going to ask me to save my vector editing polygon. So we'll just call it Edits, Save. So now I've saved the changes into my file. So I can close this if I wish, because we're done with the editing part. And I'm just going to load that initial one. So this is why we made the copy, is because we actually need the original information as well in order to do this trick. So I'm going to basically just show you. So we have the two, the one with the out the stockpiles, the one with the stockpiles still present. So I can now go to our analysis, change detection. I'm going to select our copy, or sorry, the original one that has the stockpiles in it still as our working raster. And I'm going to make sure to only select the DEM. And then for our reference one, I'm going to select the copy file, which I know is the one that we filtered out the stockpiles. We're then going to do a difference image. I'm going to uncheck to absolute and percentile. I'm going to create it as a pseudo color and click run. So now we can see we've extracted our uh, polygons, or our, sorry, not our polygons yet, but our stockpiles, um, with you know based on on the differences. So we now have the heights basically. So to to finish off this uh, workflow, we can go to algorithm library, and we're going to find our X pole RAS, which is probably one of my favorite algorithms for extracting features. And I'm going to change the input to the change layer, which is in memory right now, it's not saved to disk. And the output is I'm going to put to the viewer, so I'm just going to write the output to memory or create the output in memory. And I'm going to change my minimum threshold to 0 0.4, which is, means that we're going to extract everything that's changed more than 40 centimeters in this example. And I'm going to set my minimum area to 10,000 pixels, which is because this is very high resolution imagery, um, I'm using a very high filter to get rid of some of the smaller potential noise and then very simply click Run. So then we let the algorithm do its job. And just like that, so we can we'll keep those on. And I'm going to load this layer in our DEM editing so you can see a nice example of it. So you can see that just in a few quick clicks, and obviously it would be a lot faster if I wasn't going through and explaining everything to you as I'm doing it, so you can imagine how quick this would be. So we can now go through and we can actually see the different images here. So, and we can actually use, as well if we wish, we can use different editing tools in order to further refine them. So sometimes you're going to get, for example, where two stockpiles um, combine into one due to, say, a small ridge in between. So we can just go to our split line tool, zoom into the area, 
and then basically create a new vertex there and a new vertice over here. Let's do it one more time. And now I've successfully separated this polygon from its neighbor. So very simple. So you can do minor touch-ups at this point. And if we want to reshape a tool, for example, we can grab the reshape tool and we can just quickly draw it and we can get rid of that feature if we don't want it. And then you can just go through, but you can already begin to see, and I'm just going to say render this in a bit better of a color. Yellow is a little bit more obvious. So now you can really see how we've done a good job of extracting these different features here. And these are only, and the features that are within this polygon, this blue polygon here, which I'll make green so you can see it better. And we've extracted all the polygons in probably the same amount of time that it would take you to extract maybe one or two um, manually. Okay, so that's just a, a, a nice trick that I wanted to show you about how you can significantly improve the, the processing time or the, the manual effort involved for extracting. And we also did a nice job of extracting polygons on slopes too, which is also important to note. So now moving along. So the next area that I want to show you about, so we don't have time to run this through as a full demo, but I can show you the intermediate files and the output file. So here we can use basically a very similar approach to what I've done there to estimate tree heights of large tree stands. So this shows, and then this layer can then be input as uh, a layer for estimating biomass or a variety of other applications. So if we go back into here, and we can take a look at our forest height results. So it's important to take a look at this because some very useful things to note about this. So I'm going to load this in our DEM editing. And I want to first point out a very important fact is that when we edited out the tree features, we still maintained the slope because there's actually a pretty significant slope here. If you look at our elevation values, it ranges from 237 on top down to 159 below. So it's about a 100 meter drop in elevation, maybe even a, uh, even a little bit more. So you can see that even if we go up here, some of the tree heights, if we look at this value, so now I'm going to ask you to look down here. You can see that our tree heights for where the cursor is, is ranging between, say, 7 for these green, 10 meters for these green areas, and then all the way up to, say, 22 meters for some areas down here. And you can see it's fluctuating, so it shows that the kind of uh, spatial diversity you would expect to see. And I also did a, a comparison online to see the average tree heights for these kinds of trees in uh, Quebec area where this uh, data set's found and the uh, basically the measurements that we're showing are well within the averages of the tree heights that we would expect to see here. Okay, so let's move on. So there's other things you can do with this. So basically, there's a lot of different applications you could take advantage of. So this is actually UAV data here. And we applied, once again, a kind of a similar approach with a little bit of additional heuristics, such as taking shadows into account. And we helped, we used the shadows to help separate features, but we were able to create a semi-automatic way to uh, count different assets in an area. And as you can see, we counted 285 assets, which we then, when we manually counted the assets, we found out that our automatic or semi-automatic approach was 96% accurate. So a high level of accuracy in that respect. So now we're going to get down to some of the final uh, demonstration and application areas. So this is where we can start doing some fully automated uh, applications with DEMs and volumetric calculations. So there's a couple different approaches. So using Python, which is my preferred area, we can be very advanced and, and calculate full volumetric uh, calculations and assign them to attributes in an attribute table for each polygon. Or we can model, uh, we can use our modeling environment, uh, which we call Modeler in Geomatica, and we can basically develop workflows to automatically extract the DSMs or digital surface models from different dates, and then perform a change detection under these areas and calculate the volume of change for these areas, and then extract them of 
uh, extract these areas as polygons. So using Modeler, we can chain together these specific PPFs as they are, or these functions rather, and we can put our, for example, a 2014 or a couple months separation, so two months separation. We run our change detection optical, our XPOL RAS algorithm, as you've already seen, and we do that for both. And then we get our, at the top here, you're going to get our positive change, and at the bottom, we're going to get our negative change. And we get a result like this. So we get basically a change map, which shows the depth of change for each pixel. And as you can see in our upper areas where we have red and sort of green outlines, but red in the polygons, we approaching upwards of 17 meters of, of additional sediments in between those two months. And then when we look at these blue areas, we can see that we're going down as low as about 11 meters of additional change, or sorry, of um, subtracted or removed sediment in the last two months. And if we want to take it even a step further, and we want to be, and we want to use Python, we can then add some functions to calculate volume and map out and map this and add them to the actual polygons. So I'm actually unmuted. Quickly do that as my final demonstration. So I'm going to run our Python script here. I'm just going to run this in command line, but you can be creative and create your own special GUI. So I'm just calling the Python executable. I'm going to throw my script in there. And then I've made it so that it asks me first to provide the input uh, imagery for my test data. So that's my current or most up-to-date data that I want to compare with. So as you can see in here, it's just two aerial images with the camera calibration and EO file. If you have satellite imagery, you can do it as well, and you can include the GCP collection and bundle adjustment. Um, as automated steps. So I'm going to add that for the reference imagery. I'm just going to add the folder for 2009. I'm going to provide a mask file, which is really just an outline of the area that I'm interested in performing the analysis. So I can throw that in there, and that's going to only perform the analysis under those pixels. And then it wants me to provide an output file, in which I'm going to just throw and create a new one called volume. So we'll let that run, and while that is muted, I am going to just explain a little bit about what the processing steps are, what's happening in the script. So it's going through first, it's ingesting the data, it's extracting, it's level three data, so it's already been arrow triangulated or been run through an arrow triangulation. Uh, it's extracting, extracting the digital elevation models or digital surface models, calculating the difference DSM, extracting the stockpile. So these are all done with our, uh, with our functions that are very easy to set up and run. And then I created a special function to calculate volume uh, using our, uh, low, or our API, our raster-based API, uh, which is also available. And then finally mapping it out in Geomatica. So this is uh, just in case you're curious about the calculation of the volume, we're using a column-based approach which basically were the call the stockpile volume in meters cubed equals the resolution of our pixels squared multi um, multiplied by the sum of the difference of the height values or the elevation values or the change image basically. Sorry, the sum of the change images. And I just want to quickly touch on some of the advantages of this approach. So there's two different competing approaches for how to calculate volume of stockpiles uh, or volumes under a polygon and uh, the traditional method tends to be a contour-based volume measurement approach, but uh, based on our assessment, we've identified that it has some limitations uh, when it comes to working on complex uh, terrain. So we have areas where we introduce error if the bottom is not assumed to be flat, whereas we can see with the column-based approach, we don't have that issue. So we get similar errors when you look at uh, the side profiles, and this assumes that the contour step size is equal to the pixel size. So in this case, the pixel size was 30 centimeters, so your contour size should be no greater than 30 centimeters in this case. But we handle slopes much better in this column-based approach as opposed to uh, the traditional contour-based approach. 
And these are just some examples of where you might see stockpiles that are on slopes. So as you can see here, we get uh, basically these stockpiles over here. They're on a slope. And this one right here, these two stockpiles are leaning against a very significant gradient. Another example of where column-based approach uh, will provide superior results compared to the contour-based is when you have sort of complex substructures on the top, so it becomes a more irregular surface. And these substructures are less, uh, it's more challenging for contours, not impossible, but more challenging for contour-based approaches to measure these accurately as compared to column-based approaches. So before we get to the poll, oh, we can see that it's already finished, so we can, it already brought up the result. So we can just take a look, for example, at this polygon here. And you can see that this polygon, the volume that was assigned to it was 5,020.55 uh, meters cubed. If we look at this one over here is 2,022.4, so on and so forth. So we've, in an automated workflow, we've calculated volume for the polygons, we've extract, extracted the change based on the two different dates, and uh, mapped it on our viewer here. So with that, I'm going to say goodbye and pass it over to Kevin uh, to, find, to finish off, to close off the webinar and finish off with our final poll question. Kevin? Unmuted. Yes, uh, thank you, Sean. I think I have to change my audio because I was having some problems. Uh, hopefully everyone can hear me. Sean, can you? Muted. Okay, Kevin's uh, microphone is obviously uh, not working very well, so I am uh, muting him without his knowledge, and I am going to ask the final poll question. So, the final poll question is, did you like today's presentation, and did you find this information useful? Or We'll give a few more moments for people to uh, finish answering this poll question. Okay, it looks like the numbers are beginning to stabilize. So I'm going to close the poll in five, four, three, two, one, and the poll is closed. So with that, uh, we can finish off the webinar by taking a few questions that uh, might have been asked. So if you want, you can type your questions into the dialog box on the GoToWebinar console. And we can look to see, I'm just going to read some, some of the questions. And it looks like most of them have been addressed. So one of the questions is, this is uh, as a statement, it says, this is a very clean site that I showed. What if you have a conveyor running through a pile? Can you remove that from the pile using this method that I just demonstrated? Uh, I think that really comes down to whether or not, uh, basically how the, uh, what the conveyor looks like. Um, and we can definitely, with some of the tricks, because there's so many different filtering options and different concepts using uh, that I was not able to show, such as using uh, basically exclusion masks uh, in order to uh, sort of stabilize or prevent either certain features from being included in those volume uh, calculations that, yes, I do believe it would be possible to work on much more messy uh, sites, particularly if you have a conveyor belt running through it. One of the other uh, questions uh, that was asked is, uh, basically, will sample data sets be available? So actually, that's a great question. So that uh, was just asked a moment ago, and we are 
creating a new standard now that when we develop uh, basically uh, tutorials and when we develop uh, tech TV episodes, we are doing our best to develop it with uh, data that we are allowed to distribute for uh, education or training purposes. So we will do our best to make sure that we can provide sample data sets for these kinds of applications. Um, just trying to think of the data that I used for this webinar. Uh, we might have to see if we can get permission to distribute it. Another question that was asked is the method I showed for uh, for stockpile calculation or stockpile extraction using the live DEM editor, is it possible to do that with uh, satellite imagery? And the answer is yes, actually. We have one of our customers right now who basically use uh, satellite imagery. Uh, obviously, it must be very high resolution satellite imagery such as Pleiades or Worldview uh, or other uh, high resolution satellite images, but yes, it is possible. And and it is possible to use this technique, as well as the unautomated technique in order to automatically look for changes on a site. <laughs> there was one question about whether we can do another demonstration to show uh, another webinar for extraction of 3D buildings. Uh, obviously today we don't have time for that, however uh, we can look look in the future about uh, either providing a webinar on that or maybe a tech TV uh, or perhaps if you are interested in that we can uh, you can contact contact us directly and we can look to provide that kind of information so another question is with regards to so this would be probably the last question I have time to answer today uh, and the question was when you process a high-res stereo pair at half meter, then you process it in ortho engine with a half. I mean, is it possible to process it with a half meter output? And actually, yes. So our digital service model extraction algorithm is a dense point-based method where we are actually creating measurements for each and every uh, pixel in there. So yes, actually, some of the examples I was showing were extracted, the DSM was extracted at a one-to-one. -one. So it is quite possible to do that. Uh, I think with that, uh, if we did not get a chance to address your question today, we will certainly do our best to follow up and uh, either by email or, uh, and, and, there's and we will have a recording of this webinar. So we really appreciate uh, your participation. And on behalf of Kevin, who unfortunately had technical difficulties uh, in the latter half of this webinar, uh, we'd like to really thank everybody for joining us. And we wish you all a, a great day or a great night. And with that, have a great one. Goodbye.